O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, I do pray in your matchless name. Amen. We are in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. This, Moses continues his message to this new generation, um, preparing them for the promised land. You know, as, as they enter in, you know, the first four verses of this chapter, I think, are verses that should always remind us of God's greatness. And greater that's he that's in, in you and me than he that is in the world. We should remember, when we go through this today, I hope you know that uh, you'll learn a little bit about warfare. I hope I, I can kind of move in that direction some. But kind of show you that the battle is always the battle. And it will always be a battle. And in the eyes of God, having more is not greater than having him on your side. Having more is not greater. Having him on our side is greater. Israel would continually go up against nations that are mightier than they are. And we can often be the smaller in number and in stature when facing the enemies. But with God on our side, if God is for us, who could be against us, Paul said. If God is for us, who could be against us? In other words, successfully, because we know what's against us every day. And Moses wanted Israel to have this assurance. So Moses deals with the nation in regards to going to battle against those nations that they will fight outside of the land of Canaan, you know, and within the land of Canaan. And remember last week when we looked at chapter 19, you know, verse 8, when it said that if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your fathers and gives you the land which he promised to give to your fathers, God wanted to enlarge their borders. But this would come only by them going up against these nations in war. You think you want God to enlarge your borders? Well, you will enlarge your borders, but there's a great chance that there's going to be some battle uh, before you get there. You know, people used to pray the prayer of Jabez, Lord, enlarge my borders. And all you, really? You better know what you're asking for when you say that. You know, the word battle is mentioned 185 times in the Bible. 179 times in the Old Testament, six times in the New Testament. The word war is mentioned 418 times in the Bible. 357 times in the Old Testament, 61 times in the New Testament. The words enemy and enemies combined is mentioned 433 times in the Bible, 388 times in the Old Testament, 45 times in the New Testament. So the Bible is clear that there will be battles and wars in our lives because we have an enemy. So just be clear about that. And Peter would say, be sober and be vigilant and be or watchful, some translations, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he did everything he could to stop us from getting stuff started here today. Tonight. And it says in verse 1, I love what it says, when you go out to battle... Underline that when in your Bible because it does not say, notice it doesn't say if you go out to battle. It says when, implying that you will go to war. And we know in the book of Isaiah, everybody know that book, you know, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. We all know that. And people forget that part about the Bible it says when the enemy comes in like a flood. It never says if the enemy comes in like a flood. It says when. It's inevitable that the enemy will attack some way, somehow, somewhere in our lives, some part of our lives. And here is on the offense. When you go out to battle against your enemies, isn't that clear? And see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, and this is why, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Isn't this something, isn't this kind of interesting how when we didn't know Christ, some of us would go anywhere? We would be in some of the darkest places. We would go anywhere and wasn't afraid of anything. We could say, the people would say, oh, I don't know, I'm scared to do this now. I mean, I'm like, what? 
We're the same people would be in places, dark motorcycle clubs and everything else. And it's interesting to, to note that he says, when you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, because some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We don't need to trust in those things. He said, do not be afraid. Moses, don't be afraid. He used the Hebrew word yare, and, which means to frighten or to make dreadful. You know, God is saying, do not be afraid of them, the enemy, for the Lord your God is with you. And he brought you out of Egypt. Don't you remember that he, you know, look, if he defeated Pharaoh, who had the greatest army in the whole entire world at that particular time, what would he do to these other nations? Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. You remember that old song? I don't know how they got from Pharaoh's armies drowned in the Red Sea to, oh, Mary, don't you weep. You remember that song? And the two had nothing to do with each other. But I like the part about Pharaoh's army got drowned in the Red Sea because that's in the Bible. They're so... Many things we could look at, but these are some very encouraging words. And the number one reason why Israel shouldn't have feared anyone is because, I love this phrase, for the Lord your God is with you. Remember the psalmist wrote in Psalm 46, which was written by the sons of Korah. And he wrote a psalm, and it was what they call Elamoth. Uh, Elamoth, you know, it means that, Elamoth mean that, when they sung the song in Hebrew, you had the sopranos leading the song. Or it was in that high note, that high pitch octave. And it was, you know, and he would write to the chief musician a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song of Elamoth, you know, moth. And that one psalm he writes and he says, you know, let me, and the, the girls were singing it, I'm sure. And I don't know how they would have sung it. But it's interesting in Psalm 46, it says, God of our refuge, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And they would probably, we will not fear. You know, something like that. We will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with trembling. And later on it says, be still and know that I'm God in verse 10 in Psalm 46. When you go on through all the chaos and all the warfare, you, when you go to battle, there will be battles in our life. There will be battles in our life. And the Bible does not say, Israel, you're going to the land. God is going to give you the land. You know, people say, God is just going to give you this. Well, not really, because when they go into the land, God is using them as an instrument. And they got to have physical combat. He could have just smoked the, all of the land of Canaan, which is synonymous with the Amorites. He could have just smoked all of that land and said, go ahead and just live in the land. But if he would have did that, they would have forgot him in one day. The battles is for us to remember God. You say, if he beat him that day, I'll beat him again. And it says, so it shall be when you are on the verge of battle, that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And the priest was to encourage the people, but only from God's word. And God was to tell them what they should speak to the people. And he'll say it in the next verse. And he shall say to them, the priest, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. And he says four things. First of all, you got to walk by faith, not by sight. Don't look at what you see when you're facing stuff. Don't look at, don't look, I'm telling you, don't look at when you, the doctor say you got this or this is going to happen. And then you, don't, you, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he's that, he that comes in must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of, of those who diligently seek him. Don't never look at circumstance. Don't ever do it. And he's telling them, don't you look at the enemy. He says, today you, you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Some of them may have been like this. Do, 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 do. I don't want to go on a battle. I thought God was just going to give us the land. 
Yeah, he's going to give you the land, but you got to go through the battle to get it. We like blessings without fight. Just give me the blessings, Lord. Help me out. Make me fat. You know, bless me. The Lord said, really? I'll, I'll throw a blessing in there. Or, you know, a uh, matter of fact, Peter said, Lord, we left everything to follow you. In, in Mark chapter 10, he said, we left everything. Everything to follow you. Jesus said, oh, you'll get it back a hundredfold. But with persecution. Because we know when you have blessings, the blessings of the Lord makes one rich. He has no sorrows with it. But when we have blessings, that easily make us forget God. He says, do not let your heart faint. That's one thing. Do not be afraid. That's two. Three, do not tremble. And four, and do not be terrified because of them. And verse four tells us why. For the Lord your God, he goes with you. <laughs> Isn't that something? You shouldn't be faint-hearted, afraid, or tremble, or being terrified, because God is with us. We read it the other day. Emmanuel, God with us. God is with them. The Lord, this is the national name for the Lord, capital L, capital O, R, D, um, Jehovah, Jehovah, Elohim, your God. You know, he goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. God would be with them. He fights for them and for us. David said, had not been for the Lord on my side. And he fights for us. Remember when all, you know, the, 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 you know they came up, the Ammonites and so forth, and the whole slew came against King Jehoshaphat. And he, you know, proclaimed the fast and all this stuff. And I'm sure they were, you know, they all gathered together and they was praying and, and so forth. And then one of the worship leaders, <laughs> the worship leader, the, you know, it says the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, which means God sees, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of um, Jael, which means God snatches away, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. In the middle of the assembly, he said, listen, all you of Judah. And they were all scared to death. Listen, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismay because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the sin of Ziz, and you will find them at the brook, end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jezreel. And you will not, notice, you will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed tomorrow. God against them, for the Lord is with you. Do you believe that when battles come in your life? That the Lord is with us. He is with us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. That's E-N-N. -N. We have the Holy Spirit beside us. It's para, paracletus, paraclesis, paracletos. We have the Holy Spirit upon us when we baptize with the Spirit. Epi, upon. He comes upon us. He's with us. He lives within us through the person of the Holy Spirit. When you stand before the magistrates, says in Matthew chapter 10, don't worry about what to say. I'll give you the words. Don't fear them. And it's interesting that we often realize that we shouldn't have no battles. Life should be easy. I should sing on a choir, wear a white robe, and give some money in the offering and go straight to heaven. And well, that ain't earth. That is not this world. That is not the world we live in. And what we have here in the next set of verses are some of the reasons why one could be exempt from battle. First of all, we do know that we have, that they had to at least be 20 years of age to engage in warfare. We know that in Numbers chapter 1, verse 3. However, the exemption that, that we have here 
does not seem to apply to our modern day type of military. You know, our modern day you know, military code of exemption and so forth. You remember when we had the draft World War II, they had the draft from 1940 to 1950, to the 1950s, the draft, you were at 17, you got drafted. It was guys going to the war at 17. You know, in fact, on December, I think it was, um, December the 20th, 1957, Elvis Presley was drafted at the age of 23. Elvis Presley, you know, the Elvis Presley that had the girls going, he got drafted and, and served for three years in the military. He was stationed right in, near um, Fort Hood where my sister used to live at, right, right near um, Colleen, Texas. And there was a draft, remember the draft from 19... 69 and 1971, and it was extended for additional years of the Vietnam War, remember? And there was drafting people left and right, and then Richard Nixon got in office, was the president, and he ended the draft in 1973, remember that? They, they were drafted, and, and, and but by 1980, they received like this, we call it a selective service system. Remember, when we graduated, you had to sign up for selective services, you know, at the age of 18 through 25, those was exempt, you know, from war was clergymen, you know, pastors was exempt, and the rabbis and so forth. But here's different in Israel's system, and it seems that God is still dealing with the heart of man because he never forces his will on us because he loves us and he wants us to be single-minded towards him and choose wisely. He won't force his will. He won't say, you better join the military, you better get, he doesn't do that. Unlike the military of the world, as children of God, we are enlisted in a spiritual battle. You already enlisted the minute you got saved. Do you remember when you got saved and almost everything just started going crazy? People that liked you started hating you. Y'all remember that? And the people say, oh, that's my man, man. And then they see you, they walk the other way. I don't want nothing to do with you. Because we got enlisted into a different battle, a whole different battle. And we don't fight for victory in our battle. Y'all need to know that. We fight from victory. We've already won. This is a divine rerun. Ephesians, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6, 10, 12, rather. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And powers and rules of darkness and, you know, heaven, you know, wicked of the heavenly hosts and so forth. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And Paul, when he tells us how to be prepared, you know, with the shield of faith and shed our feet with the preparation of the gospel, the word is the sword. And, and his whole, you know, your whole outfit, you, 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 you're not fighting because you lost. You're just being prepared on how to fight. You're not going to lose. He didn't say put on the whole armor of God and you might whip Satan up. He don't say that. And they had those big shields, you know, the, the Romans would they had these big four foot shields that they would lock together. Nobody could beat Rome. And they would let these shields, it would be red, like a red leather on the front of them. They would let them soak all day in water, all day. Those shields were heavy and it would, the men would walk side by side. They would lock those shields together. And the reason why they soaked them in water all day, when the enemy shot those fiery darts, they were just extinguished. The shield of faith. And so when we go on a battle, it is a battle. And Paul describes the Christian life that, you know, as, as of a life of a soldier in 2 um, Timothy chapter 2. We're like soldiers. You want to be a soldier? They had a song years ago, we don't know who the writer is, it's an anonymous writer, but it says, we are soldiers in the army, we have to fight, Although, and then we have to hold up the, I didn't like that part, we got to hold up the bloodstained banner until we die. I didn't particularly like that part. And then some churches start adding other parts, and my mother, and all this other stuff that I don't know where they got that from. But, you know, we're soldiers in the army, but we won. So now verses 5 through 9 gives us a description of those who were exempt from military service. There were four groups of men who were exempt from going into battle. The recruitment process was free from compulsion, and it allowed those exempt to stay behind, thus not becoming a sneer or a hindrance of Israel gaining victory in the battle. In this sense, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that, because it's a bad thing when somebody on the battleground and they mind not on the battleground. That's a bad, you got somebody and you say, you know, you ever got into one of the fights? And we got into fights with our friends and stuff. And somebody's trying to sneak out, you know, but you with us. 
You know, no, 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 no. It's, it's a bad thing to get in a fight with somebody and then somebody trying to sneak out the side door. And so God said, let us exempt some of these guys so they won't be a distraction when they get on the battleground. There are some Christians that are not battle tested. The minute hardship come and the battle come, they just like, I'm out here, I'm gone. So they exempt from the battle. Some battles in your life, you're supposed to stand there. Haven't done all to stand, stand. Say, oh, I know this is hard, but stand. My brother used to punch us in the chest. He said, stand up there like a man, take this. And boom. We used to be coughing. <laughs> he said, come on, a little bit more. Boom, you know. And then when the little kids hit us in the chest, it wasn't nothing. Remember, that's all you got, buddy? That, come on, stick and move, that ain't nothing. Some people don't like those blows. If they're blows, sometimes they come from different directions. And so a soldier full attention needed to be on the battlefield and nothing else. And everybody in this room got to keep their eyes on the battlefield. So we'll see the, you know, the phrase, let them go four times in the next four verses. Each verse is going to say, let them go. <laughs> You'd be like, no, don't let them go, please. Let them go. What the number is depleting, let him go. Because he's going to be a distraction when we go into battle. Let him go. Some people are distractions. There are blessed subtractions and blessed additives in churches. Some people are a blessed subtraction. You say, praise the Lord, let him go. Some people say, no, don't let them go. They, they good for the battle. And he says in verse 9, 5 rather, Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Verse 6, Also what man is there who has planted a vineyard, maybe, maybe in between seasons, and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, Lest he die in battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who betrothed to a woman and has taken um, and has not married her? You know, that was a year for that engagement process, that espousal process. It took a whole year before you consummated the marriage. Let him go and return to his house. Lest he die in battle and another man marry his wife, her. Wow, what an exemption that is. You're like, you going to battle? No, I'm going to get married. So a lot of guys was getting, women was getting, you know, a lot of men was available, the year was battle. They say, no, 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 I don't need to go to battle. I'm getting married next month. You know, I'm, you know, a lot of guys would change their rules, and, you know, their mind about marriage. Look, it says, the officers shall speak further to the people and say, what man is there, notice, who is fearful and fainthearted? God doesn't need scary people in the battlefield. Let him go. <laughs> And return to his house, his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his. You got scary people around you? And then you start wondering. They say, man, you sure you should go down there? Man, it's crazy down there. He'd be like, I don't know. You, you, no, man, I wouldn't. Man, it's dangerous. You go down North Philly. Man, it is dangerous. Woo, I wouldn't go down there. Man, you're probably right. I shouldn't go down there. Let him go. <laughs> Let him go. Remember when Gideon had 32,000 soldiers, people forget the, uh, the math. God essentially, you know, some got left and some got sent home, but 31,700 men were, were, went home. Could you imagine them coming home to their kids and say, Daddy, I thought you was going to fight. Oh, I was scared to death, son. I didn't want to cut myself. Or, you know, could you imagine? I didn't want to battle because I wanted to see you grow up and graduate or something. Uh, we just got a new car, and I don't want nobody to drive it but me, or, or something weird, <laughs> something crazy. And your daughter looking at you, I thought you were part of the army, Daddy. You got a uniform. What you doing a uniform on, Dad? And God sent you home. Imagine if God sent you home, so you're not good, <laughs> he, and you tell you, God sent me home. Imagine that. 
And God used 300 men. And those who were faint art, he sent them home. And you get to Judges chapter 8, it says, these guys, they were exhausted, still chasing. They were chasing the enemy. The enemy wasn't chasing them. 300 men. It was 135,000 Midianites. You take 300 and divide it into 135,000, you get 450 to 1. God said, now we can go to battle because I don't have anybody distracted. I don't have anybody that don't want to be here. I don't have anybody that's scared to death. I have people that know I'm going to fight the battle for you anyway. Just follow him. Those are the people I got around me. And verse 9 says, And so it shall be when the officers have finished speaking to the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people, to lead the people, that they're going to go into battle with those who are exempt and with those who are non-exempt. We are going to battle because God said we are going to battle. Stop looking around and worry about how many people you got with you when you're doing something. If God is with you, you got everything you need. Some people say, well, I would do this, but um, uh, none of my friends is really hanging on. No, you don't. Look, you, God calls you to do stuff. Sometimes you will be by yourself. You will be by yourself. Paul told Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier. Strategos is the Greek word. He says, as a good soldier warrior of Jesus Christ. And he says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier, the, the, the word to be selected as a warrior, enlisted to become a soldier. You don't get entangled. You, you Once you set for the kingdom, there is supposed to be battles. You don't tell unbelievers, I'm going through such a hard time. I don't know what to do next. Oh, I lost everything. Oh, my, my rent is late and I'm going to lose my cars getting repossessed. You don't tell unbelievers. They say, well, what God is you? So I don't want that God you serving. You're telling the people on the job, I can't take no more. And they ain't looking at you like, I thought that was a Christian. What you don't say? You go to Calvary Chapel. Say you go to the Baptist church around the corner that's closed down or something. Because that's what, not what I'm teaching. I'm teaching you fight. You stay in the battle. You stay in the battle. It's hard. And so what? As it gets hard, you learn how to stay in it harder. But don't be a wimpy Christian every five minutes. Something goes wrong. Did you see what just happened? Oh, I don't know how we're going to make it. God said he was with me, but he ain't really with me now. No, that ain't the God we serve. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lord, I'll be with you even until the end of this earth and the end of this age. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. My name is God with us. <laughs> how can I leave you? I said, I'm, that's my name. For my name's sake, I won't leave you. And he's telling them all, you can imagine these young people listening to Moses and Moses, they looking at Moses like, hey, you're going to battle. Man, Moses, I thought he was just going to give us the land. You know, we just want God to give us something with no problems. I like problems. I do. You know why I like problems? It's one thing I like about problems. That shows you the character of God in problems and hardship. That's why I like problems. My life is just a big problem. I was thinking about that other building up there. I said, where did I get myself into? I thought about that the other day by myself. I said, how did I get myself into? And the Lord just quietly whispers, is anything too hard for God? It wasn't your ideal in the first place. And sometimes we don't realize that God will put us in places of things that's way, way bigger than us. And we're like, Lord, I don't know how, to, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And he says, you got it right. You don't know how you're going to do it, but I know how I'm going to do it. And remember that he's with us. He said he's with us. He told them that I am with you. I will be with you. I am with you. The Lord God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He's with us. If he got us out of the world we came from, come on, Macha, you know what I'm talking about. 
Some of the places we've been, and you like, what the world? And, and, and then people say, you at church? What? Yeah, I'm serving. I'm at church now. I said, really? Yeah. And God tells him, he doesn't stop there. In verse 10, you would think he said, all right, well, that's enough. We got it. He says, no, no, no. Moses continues. He says, when you go near a city... Now, these were the distant cities, not necessarily the cities in the land of Canaan. Moses is letting them know that they're going to have other battles besides the battles that they get ready to go into. He says, when you go near a city, fight against it, then proclaim and offer a peace to it. This was totally opposite of what the pagan nations would do, like the Assyrians or somebody, they would never, they would, they would just kill everybody, slaughter, crack the skulls of babies, rape wives, and, and everything else. They, they were just awful, evil men. But God said, when you go in, then proclaim and offer a peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace, this is mercy before judgment. If they accept your offer of peace, and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall place shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. In other words, war was the last resort because the very opposite of war is peace. So if Israel went into a nation and that nation of people accepted the offer of peace, that nation would become placed under the tribute to Israel and become their servants. Remember the Gibeonites? When they heard that Joshua and the nation of Israel was coming through the land, they pretended to be ambassadors from a far country that had molded bread and old clothes and stuff. You remember them? In order to make peace with Israel. And, and of course, they, they got amalgamated in with the nation of Israel and became servants in Israel to the nation of Israel. God will always show mercy before judgment. He will always show mercy before judgment. Look, the Amorites had, which means Westerners, that's what Amorite means, Westerners. Amorite is always synonymous with Canaanites. If you read Genesis, I think it's 10, 16, this is always sort of synonymous. But they had 400 years or four generations, because a generation could be 100 years, it could be 40 years. They had 400 years or four generations of mercy before God judged them. 400 years of mercy before God judged them. And he said, you know, when the Amorites, you know, iniquity is full, you know, in um, Genesis 15, 16, that's when your descendants will go back into that land and defeat the enemy of that land, whoever was in that land. That was exactly the way God told Abraham when he made a covenant with Abraham. Jesus told his disciples, whenever, you know, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who, is, who in it is worthy and stay, with, stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Or surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land, for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that particular city. So when they went into a place and they said, look, we want to make this peaceful, but you guys got to be our servants now. Because God is with us. We can beat everybody. There's no competition. You know, I'm, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I was thinking about like Mike Tyson one day. He said, when I get in that wing, I'm going to knock him out. And you know, you heard the way he's talking, but that guy ain't going to knock. Kablooey is knocking people out. He could beat everybody but Robin, you know. When I met Robin, I was ecstatic. When I met a mother, I wasn't, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and, it's a, and he could beat everybody, but he couldn't beat, you know, Robin's mom, you know. That was just a side joke. I was thinking about it. It says in verse 12, Now and if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God delivers, notice God is going, is still d 
dealing with Israel, not military strength or manpower or human ingenuity. He says, and when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, not by your power or might, but by the spirit of the Lord of hosts, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. And they did that when they went, when they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses, and they killed all the males. This is not Canaan. You know he's not talking about Canaan because when they went into Canaan, they was killing everybody. Everything left, the kids, everybody, they went in the land of Canaan. So he's talking about other cities that they would engage in battle with. But utterly destroy everyone when they went in those other cities. And it says in verse 14, but the women, the little, child, the little ones, meaning the children, the livestock and all that is in the city, all is spoil. You shall plunder for yourself and you shall eat the enemy's plunder, which the Lord your God gives you. Thus you shall do to all, not some, the cities which are very far from you. So he's not talking about the land of Canaan, which are not of the cities of these nations. So God is not talking about Canaan, but now he's turning to Canaan. But of the cities of these peoples, those in the land of Canaan, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive. God said, kill everything. Everything. Kill everything. The males, the, the women, the kids, the everything. God is speaking of Canaan. Some believe that those who inherited the land of Canaan were descendants of the Nephilim. And that's kind of creepy there. Which produced a gene pool problem and would and were depraved, perverted polygamists, and they were weird. Some of them were giants and so forth. They were creepy, perverted people. God wanted to cleanse that, rid that, rid that land of all those people. He said, "Kill everything. Their descendants don't leave nothing left. Nothing left." And He says, "But you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite, and the Amorite." And the Canaanite, which is sort of synonymous in a lot of ways, and the Perizzite, and the Havite, and the Jebusite. And, you know, the Gergesites would have been on that other list in Genesis 15. Just as the Lord your God has commanded you. There are Hittites, there are Amorites, there are Canaanites, there's Perizzites, there are Hivites, there are Jebusites in our lives that are laid before us every day that we need to utterly destroy. There's a war. You need to kill some of those all things that need to be killed. All of it. Because a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. We need to be aggressive. If you struggle with porn, throw your, get a flip phone. That's what you do. Just get a flip phone. And you only need to talk on it. If you struggle with lying, tape your mouth up. Get some that other tape, gorilla tape. I bet you stop lying then. If you struggle with stealing, tie your hands up. Whatever little thing you got, whatever Jebusite you got, whatever Amorite you got, whatever Canaanite, whatever thing you got that are part of something false and perverted in your heart, those are the things you don't try to like kill half of. You try to kill all of it. You try to kill all of it. If you had a bunch of roaches in your house, you wouldn't spray half the room. You'd be spraying like that. You try to get them all. You know, you know I'm going to let seven or eight of them live. I ain't going to mess with them. That's a little huddle on them. You, know, you would kill all of them. And so that's what God wants us to do. And he wanted Israel to do that. He says, utterly destroy them. Don't, don't listen to, don't even look at them. Utterly destroy them. So we should be the aggressors. We should attack those areas of our lives that will later become an ensnarement to us. If you don't get it now, it's going to get you later. That's the whole point. If you don't get rid of the, the Amorites and the, the Hittites, and all, you're going to worship their gods. And they're going to be, look, you can't have them. You know, you can't get nobody the measles or the mumps unless you have it. You can't get nobody corona unless you had it. And they was going to be, whatever those nations were, Israel was going to become if they didn't get rid of them. 
And some people read this, oh man, the God of the Bible, he was so mean back then. Oh, how could he just kill everybody? Little did they know the wickedness that, because he's sovereign and he knew what those kids wouldn't grow up to be in the first place. I thought he was a God of love. How could he read? Yeah, because he knows everything before everything is known to us. Like Warren Worsby said, it's pro video. God sees the video before we even got the tape. And it's interesting that, uh, look at the next verse. This, this truth applied to Israel, and it surely it can be applied to our lives as believers in a spiritual sense. Lest they teach you, notice, to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. God is telling the children of Israel, unless you destroy all the inhabitants of the land in which you're going, they will destroy you both morally and physically. And that, and, and that his wrath would turn against the nation of Israel. And you know what's going to happen in the nation of Israel. They're going to, look, they're going to worship these gods. They're going to worship, they are going to worship these gods. Joshua, year of reigning and being a leader, 25 years or so, however long he reigned was the golden years. But when Joshua died, the judges took over. And you know what it was like? A nation like our autonomous nation. Autonomous meaning that everybody can do what they want to do. This is what the nation we live in. And this is everybody did what's right in their own eyes. That's autonomy. I can do whatever I want. I have freedom to do this. I have freedom to live this way. I have freedom to think this. Don't tell me what I can't do. Matter of fact, don't tell me what I can't be. Because I have autonomy. Everybody did what's right in their own eyes. Everybody, when Joshua said, look, before he dies, look, choose you today on whom you shall serve. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord in Joshua 24, 15. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He didn't say go to the tabernacle. That was part, that was normal. But we're going to serve the Lord. Some people come to the church, but they don't serve the Lord. And he says, that's for me and us, we're going to serve the Lord because the nation of Israel will turn away. Look, if you've got a Bible, yeah, do this for me because we never did this. But I want you to turn to Psalm 106. I want all of you all to turn to Psalm 106. So you can see something because I'll come back to verse 19 and 20. But I want you to see this for you so you can see how important it is to get rid of all of those, you know, those Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Gergesites, and, and the Termites, and everything else you got around you. How to get rid of all that stuff. But Psalm 106, verse 34, I love what it says here, and it kind of makes sense. Look what it says. They did not destroy the peoples concerning whom the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols and became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. And they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus they, def they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Verse 40, therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people so that he abhorred his own inheritance and he gave them into the hand of the Gentiles and those who hated, and, and those who hated them ruled over them. You see what happened when we don't get rid of those things? The enemy start having a foothold in our life. Sin lies at your door. You can have victory over it. So God told Cain. Turn back to verse 19 in chapter 20 of Deuteronomy. It says, when you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by welding or an axe, an axe against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege for the tree of the field is man's food. He said, don't cut those apple trees down on those orange trees. Even look, you can eat that stuff. Yeah. So the tree that were good for food, that wasn't supposed to cut down. It could also use for something else later. Only the trees which, trees which you know are not trees for food, you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. 
This is a great chapter. Because look, the battle is the Lord, but we are in the war zone. And he gives us victory. Now the psalmist wrote, I love what he says. He says, all sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. And because we belong to him, in Psalm 98 verse 1, because we belong to him, we have the victory. You remember what John said? The apostle John, when he wrote to the church, John in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, John said, for whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith in the Lord. And because we have faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we have victory. Even over death, we have victory. Paul would write to the church in Corinth. He says, so when this corruptible, this, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal has to put on immortality, then shall, be, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He's quoting from Isaiah 25. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hates, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the victory. You have victory tonight, but you're going to have a battle. I don't want no battle. You don't have a battle. Well, I don't need a battle. Yes, you do. The battles, when all of it is squeezed out of us, it makes us trust the Lord. It shows us how to trust, and it humbles us. It shows us how to humble ourselves and say, Lord, if you don't fight this one, Lord, I don't have a chance. If you don't go before me, Lord, I don't have any hope. Lord, if you're not in me, I'm not going. If you're not doing, Lord, there are some battles. There's nowhere in the world I can have victory in these battles. But, Lord, you got to help me. Lord, you got to give me the victory. I can't do it by myself. You lay that before the Lord. You think the Lord can say, no, I had nothing to do with that. He's not going to say that. He's not going to say that. And the battle, you look at it and say, all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. That ain't religion. That ain't church stuff. You leave out of this door tonight, there is still stuff that goes on, and it still goes on in our life. You know, from I, if church was open every day, you should be at church every day if you could. That's how much warfare and how it will, look, it will heighten as we get closer to the end. The enemy know that his time is limited. So he want to mess with some of us. He want to mess with some of us. And you know what you say? The battle's not mine, it's the Lord's. Because God told me when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Don't worry about any battle because the Lord, if he saved you, he can keep you. And he can carry you home. That's what grace does. Saves us. Keeps us and carries us. And if you're here tonight, you say, look, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm going to tell you this much. It's only for a season. It's only for a season. It's only for a season. And the enemy tries to make everything longer than what it is. And he exaggerates everything and he exasperates and he sort of makes everything bigger than what it really is. And no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But every tongue that speaks against me in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage of God's children. No weapon, not one. God going to hook you up. That's what the song said. He's going to be with you. He's going to hang on to us. We're going to be linked and yoked to the Lord. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen? You have victory tonight. Let's give the Lord a hand. We got victory. We got victory tonight. Pray, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Let's stand up as we sing this last song. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for how sometimes we can be defeated. And, Lord, you already defeated our foe on the cross. You made a public spectacle of Satan. Disarming his principalities, Lord, and powers and making them useless. 
Because of your power, you have great power, you have great authority. It's been given to you. And so, Lord, we believe you, we trust you. There's nobody greater than you, Lord. You're the Lord God Almighty. There is no one greater than you. We need to know that. Every day, every moment, there's no one greater than you. Whatever we're up against, we need to recognize that. If it's a marriage problem, is it a sick child, is it a lack of money, a job, and there's nothing too big and too hard for our God to hand down. We trust you with our whole hearts, Lord, tonight. And if we don't, Lord, for those who don't, I pray that they'd be like that father who said, help my unbelief. And Lord, and pour your grace upon us, Lord. Show us, Lord, the things we can't see, Lord. But we do know that you are with us, and so we honor you, and we love you for that. In Jesus' name, we pray for his sake. Amen.